Hey, well, good evening, everybody. Hello, it's Brad. And I'm Krista. With the Big Family Homestead. And let me tell you what, folks. I hope you're ready for a journey into sight and sound. You've left the twilight zone, and now you're with Big Family Homestead on Sunday night. Are, are you sure? This Boom. is... A, this yeah, I'm this sure. This is the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I hope you are having a great evening so far. Yes. Don't worry. We can fix that. <laughs> yeah. We can fix that. Yeah. Oh, man. Have we got some really, really cool news stories. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some historical things. There's some findings, scientific mm -hmm. findings. Yep. And uh, I'll tell you what, it's going to be a good time. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> While we are waiting, though, um, actually, I'm, I'm just reminded, Jatan there, she sent in a good news story, and I forgot to include it. I apologize. Shame on you. In advance, Jatan. I, it was completely my fault. It's a good story, too. I'll try to save it for next week. I will remind you. It's all right. Who's ready for uh, the heat wave? You guys? Anybody? Anybody? I bet Dub the folks step in 777. the south. I bet the folks in the south are ready to be done with that heat wave that's going through Texas. Texas and Mississippi and Missouri and yeah, I, I noticed it yesterday. I was, Holy smokes! There's a heat advisory for you guys. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what. We have been. Um, Got done making 20 pounds of cowboy candy. Okay. I should know what that is. What's cowboy candy? Probably. I'm going to guess that's got to be... Um, I'm hoping it's delicious. Beef jerky. Probably. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. So anyway, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna stall for just a little bit while we wait for some folks to get here, mm -hmm. and then we're going to get on to the good news. But before we do, ladies and gentlemen, it's time. It's getting hot. It's getting... Oh... Jatan, oh, 108. Oh, All right, who's got the hottest temperature? I think 108 I might think beat that it. Might beat it. All right. I don't know if anybody from Arizona is here, but candy candied jalapenos. jalapenos. Yum. Interesting. Nice. I've never heard of cowboy candy. Candy. So for us, even in central Wisconsin on Tuesday, it's supposed to be 91. Yeah. yeah. We're not used to that. No. Uh. -uh. We are not yet. used to that. Yesterday, 97. Tomorrow Ooh. for Psalm one twenty two six. Well, welcome, guys. No cowboy yeah, candy a, is chili, chilies. chilies and syrup. Huh? Oh, maybe they uh, they have different views on what cowboy candy is. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just while we're waiting, uh, we have begun a new journey, a diet, a change, a lifestyle food change. Right. I don't like the word diet. Because it's not a it's not a temporary thing. This is a this is a this is something that we're changing for. A, we're hoping yeah. to change it. Yeah. Yeah, so. and um, well, you know, okay. Actually, we'll ask again. But if you have not already done this, please do us a favor. Mm -hmm. Won't cost you a penny. No. Nope. Won't cost you a thing. Go over to our new channel, which is Our Homestead Health. Mm -hmm. And uh, go ahead and subscribe and click the bell, even if you don't plan on watching it, because it really does help us out to yeah. get going. So Our Homestead Health, just open up a new tab. And um, if you want to follow along in the journey, both of your faces look thinner. Oh, bless you, Meg. Thank you, Meg. Yeah. If you want to follow along in the journey, so far we've been making a video every day. Yeah. I, yeah, I think so. So far. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been it's been fun. Well, trying I'm to hurting. <laughs> I know. I would just. I don't. I. I think I say that sarcastically. Um, it, the hard part is coming up with meals that are gluten free. Yeah, um, and not and, like and healthy. You know, not not. Um, you rock, Delaney B. Thank, thank you. you for putting that link up there. And and that actually have flavor. That's the thing, and not just meat, and not ever, not the same thing every day. I can't, I, I can't. I'm, yeah. I, t I got to tell you truthfully, I'm having a hard time with just meat all the time. Now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I used to love a steak, and I still love a steak, but right. 
Holy we need, mackerel. We need to have I, something different. So I got to be honest. We watch the video over there, Our Homestead Health, and you'll see, but I I want bread and I shouldn't have it. I can't have it no, right now. Not right now. Well, and we attempted pizza with a gluten-free crust yesterday, and I will never make that crust again. Blech. Wow. Yeah. Is the haircut for Brad? I no, don't know what you mean. It, it is the haircut for Brad that makes your hair or makes your face look thinner. Oh, I think. so Robert's just being nasty. No. He's like, oh, it's just a haircut. He's still fat as ever. No. Yeah, because look, Krista doesn't need to lose weight. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, of course she doesn't, in my opinion. <laughs> well, I just want to be healthy. That's all. I honestly don't care about how much I weigh. I can't tell. Robert, you're going to have to press that out, man. <laughs> Sounds like he's just being a curmudgeon. Nah. Hope not. I hope not. Yes. Crazy prepper Linda, we can eat fish. The problem being is fish is very expensive. Um, and so we raise our own... Uh, beef and chicken and we have raised uh, pork before um, we're not gonna do that anymore just because we just don't eat it um, yeah there's another there's a story on that on another video but um, so we have plenty of chicken beef and pork um, it's the fish so the yeah I because we love fish cauliflower he's not being snarky so is i don't know if he's just saying yeah no it's true man you just you're you're fat <laughs> you see how that goes it, you can so Oops. misinterpret you really can comments that's why i that's actually why i hate texting i hate it yeah uh because you can lose so much in the translation and misinterpret what people are saying yeah yeah you guys okay ha, okay have you ever had a really really bad text go wrong because of spell check I have. Yeah. Or sent a text to the wrong person that was meant for somebody else. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, man. I won't do that. Well, okay. Our Homestead Health, mm -hmm. please jump over there and subscribe. But just right. the, the quick version is you've already lost a bunch of weight. No, I've yes, only. No, I have not. You've actually lost more than I have. I've only lost three pounds. It's because I'm only eating shoes and meat. You're not eating shoes. Well, no one's looking. Okay, just want you to know. <laughs> shoes and There meat. are three pairs of shoes <laughs> under his desk. But it's my desk. I know. It just I it's sat. I came to sit down and started laughing because there's three pairs of shoes under his desk. It cracks me up. Oh, boy. So when he goes to say, where are my shoes? They're under your desk. <laughs> So back to the cauliflower uh, crust. I want to I want to address that really quick. Cauliflower is delicious, but cauliflower is very expensive unless you grow it yourself. Yeah. So I don't think we will do cauliflower crust unless I, we have it. You know, I I planted a bunch in the garden, so hopefully we can do that. But there's another recipe we have used for this for a gluten free crust with. Uh, egg, cheese, and um, almond flour. So we're gonna try, try that. that. Ooh, cream cheese. Because I mean, I I miss me some pizza, folks. Yeah. I oh, miss yeah. pizza. Yeah. Miss bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our friend uh, Plan with Jen. I think she's here. Mm -hmm. She was giving us uh, ideas that you could take cream cheese and mix in some stevia, um, and then put like a little. Piece, of, piece fruit. of fruit on there and give you kind of a pseudo cheesecake. Yeah, sounds good. I'm in. I'm in for that. And, I'm we, in. and actually, we went to. Tastes a lot better than a shoe. Yeah. I think most things taste better than shoes. <laughs> I haven't tried it yet. I mean, the, um, the cheesecake. Yeah. Uh, we went to Cloverdale, which is a local store owned by Mennonites up here. And they had two pound blocks of cream cheese for. 99 cents, folks. Yes. Two pounds. I'm not kidding. Two pounds of cream cheese for 99 cents. So, yep. yeah, we'll be using that for okay. dessert. All <laughs> right. So moving on, please jump over there and sub. We appreciate it. Won't, yep. won't cost you a thing. Uh, there's a snake in my boot. For those of you oh, uh, yeah. parents, mm -hmm. who knows what I'm talking about? What movie is that from? There's a snake in my boot. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy, howdy. <laughs> Lola Granola. 
How, what a what what a fortuitous time I, to jump on. I think she was just saying that. I, I know, don't know if but she actually perfect. even heard what we said. No, because there's a delay. <laughs> That's funny. But I guarantee you she knows this. Oh, yeah. There's a snake in my <laughs> boot. Yeah. Well, yeah. There, yeah. Right. Thankfully, so tell them. It, f- thankfully, it actually was not in my boot. But it I really happened. Because I probably would have flipped out. Uh, there was a, a snake... About a foot long, laying between my boots, <laughs> and Brad yeah. thinks it's a corn snake. I haven't looked it up. I think it, it was up, a corn snake. But um, I, I'm yeah. not scared of snakes living up here. Uh, when we were in Florida, however, I think all snakes try to hunt you down and kill you. Um, yeah, they they they're out for blood. Right, but up here they they don't bother me. So I just, of course, I'm not going to touch it with my bare hands. Or my bear's, bear's hands. hands. Urgh. So I put my gloves on and I grabbed the snake and I went and threw it in the grass. So um, I, they don't freak me out. Of course, if it was probably bigger, if it was like three or four feet long, I probably would yell for him to come get it. <laughs> I would then, get it. Because then it would freak me out. <laughs> All right. So but. since since enough of you guys know Toy Story, mm-hmm. it's a double dog dare. It's a challenge that uh, you should make appropriate Toy Story quotes. <laughs> At different spots in the uh, the broadcast this evening. Say that again. Say that uh, if the boot fits. fits. Yes, we love those movies. Yeah, before Disney decided to become <sighs> yeah morons. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Meg. They do eat rodents, but I don't want them in my garage. No, they can we eat have, rodents outside. Right. We have a cat in the garage. She can eat the rodents. Speaking of the cat, that's Speaking a nice segue. Speaking of the cat. I don't know if you have a, a picture. I have a picture. Do you? I do. The cat had kittens. That kitty. Dose kittens. Of course, they're laying on top of each Snakes other. Snakes are keto friendly. Oh, gross. <laughs> Look at those. Ah, yeah. Look at those precious little kitties. Kitties. Oh, they're so cute. So cute. Eastern brown snakes are deadly? Are they really? I don't know about them. I, I don't want that. No. Uh, unfortunately, when we lived in Florida, I had to kill a lot of snakes mm-hmm. because we had small children, and they were yeah. they were not happy snakes like vipers, rattlesnakes, coral snakes, cottonmouths, <clears throat> water moccasins. No, uh, a coral snake's not a viper, but there's I don't no care. It'll still kill you. There's no anti venom right. for uh, a coral snake. You right. just die. Right. Right, and we have many stories about well, coral little snakes. kids. They're like, look at that brightly colored thing. They'll uh, probably just yeah. pick it up. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they that was. Me out. I, I didn't like doing it, man. It scared me. Yeah, I we encountered coral snakes four times too many in that house or in Florida. In so, yeah, it yeah. was bad. Yeah. Not anyway, so the kitty. If you need a cat, no. Nope, if you need a, if you need a vicious. They are claimed. Are they both? Yes, they are both claimed. I thought there was still one that was up nope. for grabs. Nope, they are both. They are both um, claimed. So, wow! And we have uh, an appointment for her to be snip snip snipped. Mm-hmm. Yep. Australia. Yep. Uh, Sandra says oh, here in Australia, man. loads of our critters are deadly. No kidding. I can imagine. Hey, hey, Sandra, did you know? Did you know? That uh, in Wisconsin, it is legal, completely legal, to own a kangaroo. Mm -hmm. Yep, you don't have to have a permit to have a a kangaroo. How cool would that be? Uh, No. Gotta um, be honest. We have lots of critters. I don't want a kangaroo. I saw a video of this kangaroo. It It was at a rescue site. So this kangaroo had something was wrong with it, but it was at a rescue site. And it would go into these people's house every night. And just chill out with them on the couch. It had its own couch. It would like to cuddle, nuzzle for a few hours while they watched TV shows. And then to go back outside. No big deal. That's just weird. How, that, I got a wallaby. <laughs> I don't think they're the same critter. No. They look similar. Copperheads. Ooh. Yeah, I am no. awake. Copperheads are nasty. Oh, no. Yeah. What? I don't see. Yeah. Gracie Lee says, Krista, in Texas, we have lots of roaches. One day I stuck my feet in infrequently used house shoes. Hundreds of baby roaches swarmed all over my feet. (laughs) That's one of the worst ever. 
Gracie, someday I'll tell you a story about when I was in band in no, high no, no, school. No, 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 no. There was a roach involved. Oh, it was no, bad. No, 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 no. It was bad. No, I, I, I understand the the hundreds of roach, roaches. Uh, the first apartment we lived in was not really an apartment it was a, a converted garage yeah and we had german cockroaches they were there before we got there loads of oh. them we didn't know they're not okay can we move on I, no more gross critters please i, I okay so let's talk about brutus crazy prepper linda's asking hey, about robert brutus. thank you robert brutus Steele is doing great he <laughs> robert Steele sounds like a, a cowboy name i love it I'm Robert Steele. <laughs> does sound Love like it. a cowboy name. Robert Steele. Right, right. How long you been raising and roping Broncos? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So knee high to, I don't know what that is. Fourth of July. Anyway. <laughs> um, so Brutus is doing great. His behavior has changed quite Oddly. a bit. Oddly. Oddly. Shocking. When he's like, snip. Shocking. No. Um. No, he's doing really well. Um, he's got to relearn some bad behaviors or relearn good behavior. Good behaviors, um, like staying out of the kitchen, a huge pet peeve of mine. Because he sits. In, you guys have seen our kitchen. There's two ways to get in and out, right? He lays in those entryways. If you tell him to get up and move, he moves to the other one. Then you have to go to the other one, get up and move. He moves back to the. Oh, that drives me nuts. Drive me nuts. Anyway. And he's, okay, this dog is so funny because he instinctively knows exactly where the most mm -hmm. difficult spot for us to get around oh, him yeah. is going to be. And oh, yeah. that's where he li That's right. where he lays. Him and Nana both do the same thing. They, they just know. There's a walkway. You know, this house is, this. it's, it's a big house. It's big, but they have to lay right in the walkway. Or I, directly in front of the refrigerator, right. oh, or yeah. directly in front of the stove, or, or the directly sink. in front of the mm -hmm. doorway, yeah. so he can't throw anything away. Right, right. Maybe so. he's just. Maybe that's his passive aggressive way of going. You took my boys. I'm gonna make life hard for oh, you. Oh um, yeah, no, 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 no. So Brutus is doing great. Nana is doing really well. No puppies. Uh, she's actually scheduled to be spayed at the end of this month. So. Um, That'll be happening. Oh, you guys are still talking about roaches. You guys, okay. please stop. This is actually true. When I was in high school, Go for it. I'll tell this one. This you one's not a big deal. Story. Yeah, no, no, this no, no, is no not gross. this one. Oh, not this, not the. No, 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 not in okay. band. That is, that's a, that's a. Um, but this, this was kind of. I was working for an industrial septic tank removal company, and I had to go down a manhole one time and. There were loads of them. Now, that wasn't the problem. The problem was I actually saw an albino German cockroach. It was white, almost clear. That's nasty. All right, enough said. Moving that's on. That's nasty. All right, so that said, um, who's happy about uh, how hard it is to find oils and cheap fluids for your vehicles? Because I'm not happy. Mm-mm. We've been stocking up, and today I went to go get some DEF for diesel stuff, you know? There was one, just one. I couldn't find any oil that was in the right um, viscosity for my tractor, so I got the nearest one. Well, we're, we're, we were going to go to the, the farm store farm store to find to see if we could find it there. Hopefully we can get some. Yeah. Whitey Bulger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, oh, I know what it is. I want to talk to you guys about this. Um, yes, since there's 180 people here, um, 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 I want to start doing man on the street information videos. Meaning, if you know something that is unusual about what's going on, because Brace for Impact, we're not, we're not, we're, we don't do fear. We're not going to do fear, but I really want to know what everybody's seeing around the country and even around the world so that we can be prepared. Mm -hmm. Because if you know what's coming, you're going to be far better off if you do. Yeah. So if you know of something that's going on 
share the information with us. Mm-hmm. You can email it. Yep. You can even do a video or a photo. Send it to me. Send it to us because then we can put it on these uh, live streams and yep. and put those out. That'll be. We're not going to do it on Sunday nights oh, because no? okay. it's supposed to be elevated and fun. Oh, gotcha. But okay. it'll be, be a different day. Else. Yeah, we're going to do like man on the street stuff. Like we're going to literally read what okay. you sent in. Okay. And so info dot bigfamilyhomestead at gmail dot com. And that, I believe, is in the video description, isn't it? Isn't it? What? Info.bigfamilyhomestead at gmail.com. But you know what? It's time. It is not. It's time. Wait. wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. Never mind. Oh, yeah. Got it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The time of the evening where you say what you learned this week. <laughs> what did you learn this week? Hey, dubstep hero. And I do like me some dubstep. Matter of fact, check this out, dubstep hero. Oh, yeah. Analog drum machine much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what did you learn this week, crazy prepper Linda? What did you learn playing with Jen? Type, 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 type. What did you learn, mama? What did I what did I tell you? Oh. I learned. Oh yeah. So uh, one of you was asking how Dottie was. Well, I learned that she hates me. Absolutely despises me. Literally tried to kill me tonight. She did not. Yes, she did. Did not. Yes, she did. She tried to kill me with her foot. She wanted you to stop. I hadn't even touched her yet. I was just moving over there, and she's wang- f- flinging her hoof at me, trying to smack me with it. She, I'm not kidding. She, it's not just a normal kick. She moves it way out to whack me. Like that? Like that. That was, assault. Usually, that was assault, brother. <laughs> usually, it's my knee. Assaulty. I wonder if that's why I have trouble with my knee. Because she's kicked it so many times. I don't know. Uh, yeah. No. So, uh, yeah. Dottie That's cool. literally tried to kill me. I learned that eggplant blossoms are both male and female. I oh, did not know that. Very cool. Sandra said that iceberg lettuce was $10 each. Oh, my gosh. I hope not. Yeah. That's... That's kind of ridiculous. That, yeah, that's insane. I don't know where Sandra's at. Is she, I learned how to set a wait, live trap. Isn't that's she cool. in Australia? Sandra? I'm not sure. I want to say she's in Australia. I am not sure. But that should not be right. Wow. Crazy prepper Linda says she uh, learned how to hook up a solar panel. That's Very really cool. cool. I've learned uh, I need to have seed starting limits or to pace myself. Oh, yeah. I learned that four mosquito bites in the crease of your elbow is not fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I learned that, um, boy, oh, boy, I like bread. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like bread, too. Bread, bread, bread. Bread is best. Yes. I like bread. I like my shoes. Well, I got three <laughs> pairs down there, apparently. I know. Apparently, that's too many. Yeah, yeah. Sandra's from Australia. Oh, Truly. So yeah. so, yeah. Ow. Ouch. That's insane. Wow. So, what did you guys learn? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody yeah. else? Yeah, Old Glory Farms, learning how to remake, or relearning how to make cheese. I've been doing that, too. Robert is uh, learning that uh, software development for free. That's cool. <laughs> what kind of software, Robert? <laughs> I'm interested. I learned that Back to Eden Garden movie. Oh, oh okay, watching Oh, it. yeah, that's a great one. Raspberry picking in Blanchester. Oh, Jan, that's cool. Blanchester, Ohio. Yeah, we live there. Yeah, I, I really liked Blanchester. That, I liked Blan. It was really nice town. You know, we probably would still be there if it wasn't for that house. <laughs> yeah, probably not. You know that whole pesky... Shifted off of the foundation kind of thing? I don't know. There's that. Yeah. Back so. to... You know, there is another version of that, uh, the back to Sweden gardening <laughs> method where you use fish and you yell, mm, bork, bork, bork. You throw fish. Anybody? Anybody? Everybody's ditched on the uh, uh, Toy Story quotes. Well, it's they, you said to, you know, um, 
to make it applicable. So. Well, yeah, but there's plenty. <laughs> anyway, I'm ready for some good news. Are you guys ready for some good news? <laughs> yes, please. What? I'm just... <laughs> what? <sighs> Time for some good news. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we're doing this is there's plenty of bad. Mm-hmm. Plenty of bad. We don't need to do that. We can... You could over OD on bad every yeah. day, twice a day, and, and maybe even three times on Sunday. Down. I mean, it's not, it's not beneficial to anything. Yes, you should, you should watch the news. You should pay attention to what's going on in the world, but don't you deal should with fear. Not dwell on it and move on. All right, Mama, you are up. I'm odd tonight. You are Mwah very ha odd. Ha 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 ha. ha. <laughs> she is the queen of odd. Yes. Yes, that I am. That should be a title. I like that. Queen of odd. Queen of odd. Yeah, that's my like life. Like the Wizard of Odd? No, it's Wizard of Oz. Close enough. <laughs> Just one pesky little word. Uh, or little letter. Two. Yeah, two. Go, go, mm -hmm. go. All right, so this is really cool. A Japanese man has once again completed his favorite pastime of sailing across the Pacific Ocean without stopping. No stopping. No stopping. No stopping. The undeterrable Kinchi Hori did it once before when he was 23 years old and probably didn't expect to be pulling the same stunt 60 years later. But that's just who he is. Embarking on the 27th of March in his 2,182-pound, 19-foot-long sail sailboat, the Suntree Mermaid 3, Hori sailed solo for two months across the world's wow. largest ocean before arriving at the Ki Peninsula in western Japan at 2.39 a.m. local time. Nice. Don't let your dreams just stay dreams. Have a goal and work towards achieving this and a beautiful life awaits. Hori told the news, the news channel over a satellite phone. Making no port calls, Hori nevertheless called his family every day to check in. That was wise. That was good. The Guardian reports that he will arrive in Cape Hinomisaki. That sounds good. Sounds great. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. This Saturday, after he, after which he will be towed to his home port in order to appear at an arrival at an arrival ceremony in mm, Another good one? Nishiomi, sure, city in the Hyogo <laughs> Prefecture. We need to learn I'm some Japanese. These names. It is not his first award ceremony because it's not his first transatlantic voyage. As a 23-year-old used car parts salesman, Hori became the first person ever to make a non-stop, unaided voyage across the Pacific. Wow. During which he only ate rice, canned food, and had a single radio for communication aboard a a plywood vessel, no less. I had the confidence that I would make it. I just wanted to take on the challenge. When he arrived under the Golden Gate Bridge, 94 days later, he was promptly ar arrested as he neither had a passport nor money. <laughs> when Mayor George Christopher heard what he had done, he gave Hori an honorary visa and he became a mini wow. celebrity. The boat in which he arrived in is held in the National Maritime Museum in California with a placard that reads, Recall, recall for a short moment, if you will, the deed of, young Jap of a young Japanese who loved the yacht and the United States of America. Wow. Kinchi Hori was, has actually crossed the Pacific many times, often on yachts built of recycled materials like beer kegs, oh. plastic bottles, or aluminum cans. Once, one was even solar-powered. 
He does these things and hopes to continue them until the age of 100 to raise awareness of the irreplaceable resource that is the ocean. Wow. I didn't think I'd be sailing at 83, but I'm still healthy and I didn't want to miss this chance. Challenges are exciting, so I'd like to keep trying. You know what? That's Hats awesome. off to you, dude. No Hats kidding. Hats off to you. No kidding. If you come to Wisconsin, you, sir, you, sir, will be treated to an honorary Culver's Deluxe mm -hmm. meal Yeah. on the house. Yes. We will take care of you. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Holy mackerel. But he's so healthy, he probably wouldn't want it. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. No. Goodness gracious. That's, that's pretty cool. And, and you're going to notice there are a few stories in here uh, tonight, guys, that kind of don't let us off the hook. And by that, what I mean is... If he can do it, why he can't can do I do it? it? Mm -hmm. There's a few stories like that. Yeah. So. Hawks Bay, New Zealand. Wow. Cool. That's Hello, awesome. Barry. Hey, Barry. All right. Next story. Band leader, radio star, Spike Jones. He knew gold when he heard it, and this was gold. Where on earth did this song come from? He asked band members and broadcasting colleagues... The reply, shrugs all around. We ought to record it, he suggested. But there was a problem. A dispute between the musicians' union and recording studios, and it was rapidly escalating into a war. As of New Year's Day, 1948, the union was stonewalling the studios, and the date is now December 31st, 1947. New Year's Eve... If we're going to do this, Spike Jones explained, we'd better do it now. So with the, count, uh, the countdown clock ticking, he got the band together. He headed for the studio, leaving unanswered that intriguing question. Where did the song come from in the first place? The real and remarkable answer is as to follow. Well, once upon a time, an autumn eve, three years previous, in the sleepy little hamlet of Smithtown, Long Island, there was a grade school music teacher named Donald Gardner. The school at which Don taught was so small that all of the grades performed at the annual choral concert. And this particular year, he had selected a song for each grade to sing, except for the second grade. And when pondering an appropriate selection, the second grade teacher, Betty Stoll, said something funny. Her entire class began to laugh. And at that moment, Don Gardner got the idea for the song, a song that he would write for the second graders at Smithtown. And he did, and everybody loved it. Two years later, at the urging of friends, Don played the song for a music publisher. The publisher took it, and sent several copies here and there, hoping some popular artist might sing it. But instead, he was ignored until a year after that when Spike Jones discovered it and became determined to record it. Well, now it's New Year's Eve. It's 1947, half past 11. Less than a half, in less than a half hour, the RCA studios will close for who knows how long. Hmm. So if Spike Jones wants to record Don Gardner's song, he and his band will have to make that recording right now. At five minutes till midnight, they finished. But RCA will not release that record for another 11 months. You see, the grammar school choral concert for which Don Gardner wrote that song was in 1944, a Christmas program. And since the union battles with the recording studios raged all through 1948, Don Gardner's tune was the only new Christmas song released and played on the radio that year. Mm. And as a result, being the only one, it was broadcast day and night and became an instant holiday classic. And it has remained such to this day. For what inspired that music teacher, Don Gardner, as he prepared for his school's Christmas pageant back in 1944, was the laughter of the second graders. The broad smiles revealing a condition, a condition common to children that age, 
affecting more than two-thirds of Don's second grade class, in fact. That's right. Mm -hmm. All of those young smiles inspired the entreaty that began the song entitled, All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth. Oh my gosh. That something. That is so hysterical. Can you believe? Can you believe that that's the kind of thing no. that, as at air quotes, as fate would have it? Right, right. That that's they so that funny. it was the only new song, so the radio stations and TV stations they played the snot out of it. Mm-hmm. How about that? Jeez. And honestly, that's what that that song drives me crazy. It's it's one of my least favorites. I don't like that. It's not song. even on my favorite no, list. No. No. The it's a funny story, just not a fan of the song. And yeah, you, you got to know that guy Don Gardner. Mm-hmm. I bet he's rich. I, I bet hope he's so. rich. I hope so. Cuz if he owned the publishing on that, it's just it's never stopped. Exactly. I mean, I'm sure he's passed I'm now. I'm sure he's passed, but, but maybe it's moved his on to his family. family. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so this next story is This is encouraging to everyone. <laughs> this is encouraging to everyone. So don't don't hear the political affiliation because we don't do politics tonight. No, no. So you know I I'm not even gonna say they re- that affiliation. So, yeah, I just don't even. Last month, uh, the rookie governor of Virginia may have squashed any partisan quarreling in his state following his unexpected election. How? By abolishing traffic ticket and arrest quotas for police. Did you hear that? Quotas. Yeah. Oh, and, and it, this governor. Yeah, this governor signed. I mean, if you guys want to know, you, you can, can, you can look at look it up. Signed the law with total bipartisan support, joining 20 other states that have issued similar bans. The National Motorists uh, Association says that a speed trap exists wherever traffic enforcement is focused on extracting revenue from drivers instead of improving safety. Cool. Yeah. To that end, Arkansas, California, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Iowa, Louisiana, Montana, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, (laughs) and Wisconsin have all passed legislation barring in different ways the establishment of ticket ticketing quotas or ticket numbers as a prominent part of performance evaluation. It's difficult, however, to conjure examples of everyday, oh, policing like a Virginia can, Virginian can. Take this standard of protection expected of Alexandria officers, for example. It requires them to issue eight tickets per 10 shift hours wow or face performance improvement courses oh in fiscal 2019 virginia generated a staggering 298 million in revenue from fines fees and forfeitures in the fourth highest i'm sorry the fourth highest in the nation when the bill hit committee senator Uh, He was confused they even existed at all. You used to hear about these all the time uh, many, 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 many years ago, the senator said. I thought these were pretty much something that was done away with. You're still saying it exists? Oh, Mm. yes, it does. There shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. No, it should not be. It's ridiculous. So, um, Lola Granola... My dad was a singer. He was, he was a, uh, his, his stage name is Dwayne D. Mm-hmm. D-E-E. And his, uh, his two most famous songs, because if you were an artist back in, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, if you were a solo artist, you, you basically did not write your music. It was always set up the way the unions worked. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was very odd if you did write your own music. So right. when you look it up, you're going to go, he didn't write that. Well, no, nobody did. Well, um, somebody did. I mean, but... no, the artist did not. Right. But his two big hits were Sweet Apple Wine mm-hmm. 
and uh, before the next teardrop falls. Yeah. So there. Right. All right. Here we go. On your mark, get set. Let's get rid of that one. And we'll get this one going. Rats <sighs> are Yuck. being used to train. Or, uh, excuse me, rats are being trained to be sent into earthquake debris wearing tiny backpacks so rescue teams can talk to survivors. Boom. Oh, gross. Yeah. The innovative project is being worked on by 33-year-old research scientist Dr. Donna Keene from Glasgow. So far, seven rats have been trained, taking only two weeks to get them up to speed. What? Yeah. That's crazy. At the moment, homemade prototype backpacks backpacks containing a microphone are being used, and scientists are sending them into mock debris. Cool. Specialist backpacks containing microphones and video gear, as well as location trackers, will be created to allow rescue teams to communicate with survivors during real earthquakes. Donna has been based in Morogo, Tanzania for one year, working with nonprofit organization Apopo for a project named Hero Rats. The rodents will get a chance to work in the field when they are sent to Turkey, which is prone to earthquakes, to work with a search and rescue team. Donna, who studied ecology at Strathclyde University before going on to do an MA at the University of Kent and a PhD at Stirling University, Originally was interested in primate behavior, but she was fascinated by how quickly rats can learn and be trained. She said it's a misconception that they are unhygienic. Um, pause. Still don't want them around my face. Uh, no. No. Yeah. Sorry. Altogether, 170 rats are being trained for the project, including landmines. Now, that's, that's interesting. And TB. I don't know what TB is supposed to be. TB. Tuberculosis. Yeah. <laughs> and it is hoped that rats could sniff out Brucellosis. Br 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 it must be some it's kind an of infectious disease. disease. Yeah. An infectious disease which impacts livestock. Okay. That's, now we're talking. No, I don't want that. The rats are so nimble that they never set off a landmine. Wow. And their agility makes them perfect for using, uh, being used in disaster zones. Rats would be able to get into small spaces to get the victims buried in the rubble, Donna said. Wow. We have not been in a real situation yet. We have got mock debris sites. When we get the new, these new backpacks, we will be able to hear from where we are based and where the rat is inside the debris. The rodents are trained to respond to a beep, which calls them back to the base. Wow. They're very Crazy. trainable. The first stage is to train them to come back to the base point um, where they respond to the beep. Donna added, we hope it will save lives. The results are really promising. I, that still would freak me out, honestly. Uh, it would still freak me out. It kind of feels like a nightmare waiting to happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like definitely. You're trapped in rubble. Maybe and you're hurt. We, uh, okay. Let's not even go there, please. Yeah. Let's 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 move. You know on. what? If they, I'll tell you what, though. In all honesty, if they can, if they can suss out landmine fields, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Army of rats. Yeah. Let them go through there. You know, because heck yeah, man. Uh, and I, we love animals, don't get me wrong, right. but I'm sorry, a rat is not as valuable as a human. No. A child walking into a landmine field, because they, it's, it happens all over the world. Yeah, it's not a good, good no. thing. No. So not you at need all. to, you need to pause and tell them, we mother. We need to pause. You need to pause. And tell you. Tell them. <laughs> um, our cookbooks on our website and uh, our ointments and lip balms are still on sale. And we'll probably be taking them off um, sale. sale this yeah. week sometime. So check them out. They're, please do. Yeah, please do. So it's funny because a lot plug. of the recipes right now we can't have, but no, you can. No, we. There are lots of them in there, and and honestly, you know, I can go through there and tailor them to 
um, a gluten-free diet. Like I purchased um, arrowroot flour that I can use as a thickener as opposed to flour. Arrowroot f- powder, not flour. Yeah. yeah. So we can use that as a thickener because um, it's better than cornstarch. So we can use that to make a gravy. Yeah. But we're okay. still working on it. So sales almost over. Yep. It does help us out. Thank yep. you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, shameless plug over. There you go. <laughs> oh, this, this is cool. Such a cool story. You such picked this cool one story. specifically. I did. I did. Austria, 1844. Yes, I said 1844. Yep. Vienna General Hospital. Something's killing the mothers on maternity ward one. Just maternity ward one. In each case, following a successful childbirth, the mother would dehydrate, develop blue-violet spots all over her body, and die. For a better, for a lack of a better term, the doctors were calling it a pure pearl fever. The truth is nobody knew what it was, and whatever it was, it was snuffling, snuffing out the lives of one in five. Insane. It's a lot. And yet, while the physicians on Ward 1 played tag with the Grim Reaper, one young doctor tracked him down. Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, a fledgling obstetrician, an assigned to the first maternity ward, I'm sorry, the first maternity division of Vienna General Hospital. The mothers in ward one were dying, one in five, and young Dr. Semmelweis was uh, determined to discover why, because over on ward two, where midwives performed the examinations and deliveries, the mortality rate was not exceptional, but it was just on ward one. Where the physicians were, that the mysterious plague was also. Dr. Semmelweis drew comparisons. He noted that the woman, women on Ward 2 were placed on their sides during labor. He requested that the practice be followed on Ward 1. The mothers continued to die. Then he observed a certain priest making the rounds through the first division. His major ex- occupation to administer last rites. Was it possible the priest was literally scaring the women to death? Dr. Semmelweis removed him from the ward. The mothers continued to die. The last, the young physician took a shot in the dark. All known variables between wards one and two have been examined and dismissed, except for the most obvious difference of all, the midwives and the doctors, were unwittingly poisoning their patients. Dr. Semmelweis proposed a remedy. The remedy was successful. Whereas one in five mothers had been dying in the first maternity division, the mortality rate now dropped to one in 100. Whoa. Um, I lost my place. Second line. And yet, despite the most conclusive evidence that Dr. Semmelweis was right, his colleagues turned on him. His diagnosis were unsound, they said. His remedy was offensible, they said. They ridiculed him. They antagonized him. They even got him fired from this post, Vienna, from his post, Vienna General Hospital. Discontinuing the effective procedure, Dr. Semmelweis had originated. These physicians had, uh, these physicians watched the mortality rate ascend once more, and still they rejected his theory. In fact, Dr. Semmelweis lived with the rejection all of the rest of his life. In his, in his treatise, as he declared that the murder must stop, his writings, however, were largely ignored. The bitterness ate away at the brilliant brain until his mind itself was lost, and he died in an asylum August 13, 1865, at the age of 47. It was such a simple procedure that Dr. Semmelweis espoused, a remedy that he had had proved effective, and yet his colleagues cast him and his theory aside, accused him of, and eventually drove him to madness. Three decades before anyone imagined that a doctor could transmit death from one patient to another, three decades before Louis Pasteur named the real assassins as 
bacteria. The procedure Dr. Semmelweis had proposed the ritual, his, the ritual his colleagues found so repugnant was washing their hands. Unbelievable. Simple act of washing your hands. Drop the mortality rate from one, one in five, five to, to one, one in 100. 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how, honestly, how arrogant and selfish that was not to wash their hands to save these women's lives. And what I found interesting was the midwives had a much better rate. Because they were not dealing with the deceased. They were not dealing with the diseased people and then going to these they women only dealt and with giving the, the, the women. They only dealt yeah. with the women having babies. They were not going back and forth. That's why they didn't have a problem with mortality. Wow. Yeah. Well, and the other, the other sad, sad part to this, the guy literally went insane. He went nuts, yeah. He went insane. Yeah. He was institutionalized, mm -hmm. and he died there at 47. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Obviously, the guy was a genius. <laughs> yes. Oh, he yeah. figured it out. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then guess who gets credited for it? Louis Pasteur, 30 years later. There you have it. Yeah. This is cool. Well, I'll wash my hands. Ooh, that's I'll wash pretty. them. Yep. Shark Bay, Australia. Shark bait. Hoo ha ha. Not shark bait. Hoo ha ha. <laughs> shark Bay, Australia. <laughs> should perhaps uh, consider a name change to Seagrass Bay, since now the largest resident isn't a great white predator, but a single seagrass meadow. After discovering the whole bay's worth of seagrass spread from one seed was all part of the same plant. It instantly became the world's largest plant, as large as 20,000 football fields. At 77 square miles, it's three times the size of Manhattan and could be 4,500 years old to boot. Neither old trees nor big trees are anything new. GNN recently reported on the rethinking of the world's oldest tree list after dating of the Patagonian cypress revealed to be over 5,000 years old. And anyone who has visited the Sequoia National Park will know that some of the bigger trees can uh, add to the equivalent weight of a 40-year-old oak in wood by volume every year. As it turns out, quantity beats quality. And the numerous waving arms of the single seagrass meadow at the bottom of Shark Bay, Australia, that can now be considered the world's largest plant. Jeez. Jane Edgelow and colleagues took samples from several stocks from across Shark Bay, looking to find out how many individual plants made up the rich meadow, which spreads 110 miles throughout the giant inlet. The answer blew us away. There was just one edge load, one plant. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Just one plant has expanded over the 180 kilometers in Shark Bay, making it the largest known plant on Earth. Seagrass in healthy conditions can grow around a little more than one foot or 35 centimeters a year, making it similar to most lawn grasses. At that rate, to reach the size it is today, this specimen of Poseidon's ribbon, or ribbon weed, <laughs> needed 4,500 years at least. It appears to be really resilient, experiencing a wide range of temperatures and salinities plus extreme high light conditions, which together would typically be highly stressful for most plants. How about Crazy. That? One plant. That's crazy. That's a lot of seaweed, man. Mm -hmm. Let's just okay. Let's let's look at this like opportunity is knocking because who doesn't like a nice California roll, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit of sushi right there. Right, right, right there. You know, okay. Speaking of California rolls, this is going to be really. I strange. love California rolls. You know they sell them at Quick Trip. Gas station. It's a gas station, Ugh. and they it sell is so bizarre. two different kinds of egg, uh, California sushi, rolls. Cal California rolls, and then something else. <laughs> it's 
It's like, there's no way I'm going to buy sushi from a gas station. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that, I thought it's a that lot was of sushi. Quite, and I like Quick Trip. I really do. They have a lot of great deals. and It's kind of weird to say that the best donuts around are at the gas station. <laughs> but they are. Yes. <laughs> they really are. Charlie, would you please say hi to Charlie? Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. <laughs> How are you doing? How's it going? <laughs> okay. This, okay, this is another really it's crazy fascinating. story. Yeah. United States Admiral David Glasgow Farragut. The rank, the rank of Admiral was created especially for him, and yet he is best remembered for a solid, solitary uttered command. He gave the order the Civil War, uh, the American Civil War during the Battle of Mobile Bay. He said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. According to popular history, the, that 1864 battle was David Farragut's greatest adventure, but he might not agree. You see, Admiral Farragut, the sea soldier who cursed the mines of Mobile Bay, they called mines torpedoes back then. He, David Farragut, earned, hard-earned his self-confidence because many years before, when David was a young midshipman serving aboard the um, American frigate Essex, he was faced with an admiral-sized challenge. The Essex was cruising off the coast of Peru. She had been sent to protect American whaling ships in those waters. And if necessary, to rescue them before, uh, from British men of, the, of war. In fact, one day she did rescue an American vessel, the Alexander Barclay. And there was a problem. The rescued whaler was unarmed and consequently her crew was anxious. So they asked the captain if the Essex could take them aboard and, safe, and, and safely to port. When the captain agreed, he sent a few from his crew to sail the whaler alongside. He, and he put midshipman David Farragut in, in command. Now Farragut had been in the Navy three years, but nothing could have prepared him for the obstacle he now stood, that now stood in his way. The displaced and disgruntled captain from the, of the whaling ship Barclay. No, he would not be removed to the Essex. No, he would not take orders from Farragut. Farragut tried to be diplomatic. He asked the he even asked the Barclay captain, "Should we now fill the main topsail? Was that a mistake?" The captain of the whaler shouted that he would give the orders here and and further that he was going to get his pistols and shoot the first man to obey anyone else's. He went below. Do you know what? Instead of cowering under the icy rage of an elder, of an older elder, <laughs> more knowledgeable seaman, David Farragut, destined for greatness, remembered his responsibility, summoned his courage, and ordered the main topsail filled. And with the entire crew watching, he strolled down to the captain's cabin and told the irate old salt that any man carrying pistols on deck would be thrown over the side. The remainder of the voyage, <laughs> there were no more objections, no more difficulties. Midshipman David Farragut skillfully brought the Barclay into port. Of course, years later, he would damn the torpedoes in Mobile Bay and eventually become the United States, United States Navy's first admiral. Mm -hmm. But... Naval historians suggest that it was Farragut's first command on the Alexander Barclay off the coast of Peru, which laid the foundation for his destiny. Surely that is so. Only now you know. Oh, did I mention that during the Barclay adventure, David Farragut's first experience as master of the ship at sea, that when he was spontaneously promoted from midshipman to captain, he, David Farragut, already having spent three years in the Navy, was a mere 12 years young. What? So he went to the Navy when he was nine, nine and became a captain at 12. 
probably temporary, but still. Yeah, I'm sure it was temporary. But still. But still, that set you his... are You're commanding mm-hmm. an old salty dog. Mm-hmm. It had to get in his face. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, what would so that be like funny. today? What would that be like today? You'd, you'd ask, you know, can, can I just get you a puppy dog and some crayons, maybe? A little safe space. Can I can I have that instead? Mm-mm. Whoa. Mm-mm. Yeah. Wow. Nine years old. Twelve years old. Yeah. 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 That that I read that earlier as a nice baker mom. Exactly. What? Exactly. Yep. Goodness gracious. All right. So here this goes. Last story of the evening. Mm-hmm. By the time Dennis Wachoki was a senior at St. Francis de Sales School High School in Chicago. He was a star athlete. Of course, he had really been ever since his freshman year. He was an excellent swimmer and basketball player and softball pitcher. uh, His best sport, however, was football. You see, in 1978, he was named the best kicker in the Illinois Catholic Football League. He'd booted nearly 300 points for his team throughout his illustrious high school career. His varsity coach called him incredible. Unlike most of his teammates, Dennis was always calm, relaxed, confident, and when he walked out onto the playing field, and there was yet another way in which Dennis differed from his classmates. He didn't talk much about it. He didn't have to. You see, young Dennis got his start in sports in the streets. Even then, football was his game. He was such a prodigious athlete by the time he had reached high school that he had no trouble at making the team. And so he might concentrate on football, and he had to push swimming and basketball and softball further down his list of priorities. And of course, as practically every mother of an aspiring football player Mrs. Wachoki, or I think I'm saying that wrong, Wachoki, was at first concerned about Dennis's wild enthusiasm, but matter-of-factly reassuring mom that he would be all right. Dennis went on to become the most extraordinary football player his school ever turned out. Dennis played first string, punts, extra points, field goals. In his 1978 season, In a contest between St. Francis de Sales and Weber, Dennis's three field goals were his his team's only score, so they won that one 9-7. Dennis's coach, Mike Mannett, had seen a lot of players come and go, but Dennis was different, the coach said. In the first place, as you know, he had already had an athletic reputation before high school, and the coach always worries a, a lot about a hot shot from junior high physically and psychologically. Expectations are sometimes completely unrealistic. But Dennis never flinched. He was in there all the way. Through the hottest days in August training, Dennis, a kicker remembered, would tackle every grueling drill as though he were trying out for middle linebacker. Wow. So where is he now? Well, Dennis could have made it to the NFL, but he wanted a more normal life. So he went to college at St. Francis in Joliet, majored in mathematics. Then he got a job with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency and got married. He had twins, a boy and a girl. So it's wonderful life. But friends won't let him forget that once there was a fleeting wisp of glory a high school athletic career such as few have ever experienced. But as I say, Dennis Wojcicki was different from his fellow teammates in every way his stunning record would never suggest. You see, when Dennis played basketball, he shot baskets with his feet. And playing softball, he pitched with one foot. As a football kicker, He really didn't need what he didn't have because, you see, Dennis, the superstar of DeSales High, well, he was born without arms. That's true. 
so it's true. It's so true. Amazing, honestly. And we, we make we make excuses for the littlest things. Oh yeah, we were actually talking to Caleb about this one before we went live, and he was just blown away. Mouth open. Yeah. You know, I've actually met a guy. Um, and I cannot think of his, his name right now for the life of me. Ferdinand, isn't it? It's, it's his first I name, think, right? I don't think so. He's a guitar player who's played, he's actually played for the Pope in Rome. And uh, he also has no arms, but he plays guitar with his feet. I've watched him do it. He can chord out the Tony chords. Tony Melendez. Tony Melendez, that's right. That's it. Yep, Tony Melendez. Yeah. Yeah. And we make we make uh, excuses for the littlest things, yeah. don't we? Goodness. So yep, there he is. There I he remember is. him. Google him. Yep. The Tony dude's Melendez, a rock star. Yeah. It's amazing. I He's remember a rock him. star. All right, folks. A couple things before we say goodnight. If you don't mind, go over to our Homestead Health. Mm -hmm. Do the subscribe and mm -hmm. bell thing, and that'll help us out. Yeah. Um, cookbooks. They're on sale for yes. a limited time only. Yes, uh, just a few more days. I'm not exactly sure when we're gonna take those off sale. Maybe okay. Let's let's set a day. Maybe. It's up to you. Let's let's okay next Saturday. Next Saturday they will not be on sale anymore. Okay. So. Helps us out. Yep. And um, last thing, if you are interested in finding a a Bible study mm -hmm. slash devotion, we keep it separate from Big Family Homestead because frankly. Um, we don't want to push anything on anybody. Right. Uh, we do believe that that's how God operates. He's not going to force mm -hmm. himself on you. So no. if you want to come, we have a great time. It's Monday through Friday starting tomorrow, mm -hmm. 8.30 Central. Yep, a.m. On, oh, different channel name. Big, big Family, family devotions. devotions. Yes. So Big Family Devotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're in, um, we're in John right yep. now. John, chapter three, I think. It's in the beginning. My notes Looks are down like there. Chapter three. I'm, so. He's got his notes down here on the floor. So. Anyway, that is it, folks. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you had a good time. Yeah. A lot of good stories. stories. Awesome. I love them. Yeah. I love them. So that's it. Um, no surprise. Hey, we're, we're believers, so we're going to pray real quick. Yep. And uh, hopefully you guys have an awesome evening. So mark it set. Here we go. Father God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for each and every one of these people here. Please bless them. Let them know that you love them. And there's nothing they could do to keep you away. You love them regardless. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's it, guys. Er, is that the right one? I think so. Have a All good right. night, everyone. Have a blessed evening. Bye.
Strong tower against the enemy. 